What can I say about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that hasn't already been said? It's a well-deserved classic, the grandfather of the slasher genre that shook the innocent American minds in 1974. How many times have you heard how bloody this film is? Except that it isn't. Intense? Sure. Its visual, unrelenting approach hints at more than it actually shows. <laughs> This sweaty, saturated 16mm shot film changed the game and still holds up as an effective nail-biting exercise in tension. Years later, writer and director Toby Hooper signed a three-picture deal with the Lords of Schlock over at Canon Films, with the contract stating that one out of the three films must be a sequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Going the route that Evil Dead 2 and Gremlins 2 would be applauded for later on, Chainsaw 2 leaned heavily into its humor and went bigger, more zany. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. Though a success financially, Cannon wanted a horror movie, but instead got a black comedy. Hooper was done with the series he created and went on to other projects. But as the saying goes, money talks and bullshit walks, and no one leaves money on the table. So four years later, New Line acquired the rights and went on resurrecting the well-known IP with Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now back then, New Line was on top of the genre during the late 80s and early 90s, making it big with Nightmare on Elm Street. They also went on to acquire Jason Voorhees and finally, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But since you're here with me, you know that uh, things really weren't perfectly splendid. And like every other entry here, became either mangled, changed, picked apart, or f***ed. So let's drive into the blood and guts of Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and ask, what the f*** happened to this horror movie? As the first became a genre classic, with the character of Leatherface starting the big six, and the sequel making good money, it was clear there was an audience that wanted more. New Line realized that a new sequel that would harken back to the tone of the original could potentially be a big money maker. Enter New Line Cinema's Mike DeLuca, a big fan and a lover of the horror genre. He pushed for a more commercial, yet modest budget film, somewhere financially between parts one and two, that would stay more authentically true to what had come before and hopefully spawn a new series of sequels. New Line impatiently went full steam ahead without even hiring a director. An idea? Check. A designer? Eh, check. A director to hone the specific vision? Eh, no need. And after a short list of potential directors, and at the 11th hour, Jeff Burr was eventually chosen. Now, funny enough, Peter Jackson was on said list. You see, New Line liked Jackson and nearly used his script for the then supposed franchise swan song, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Before that script was chosen, New Line let him take a crack at it with his script, A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, The Dream Lover. The point is New Line wanted to offer Jackson directing duties on good faith, but ended up going with Jeff Burr, who was coming off the successful sequel, The Stepfather Part 2, starring the excellent and always amazing Terry O'Quinn. Before Burr was even hired, New Line jumped the gun and put out a teaser trailer of footage that wouldn't be included in the film. Sort of how bands would release an EP with a song that wouldn't be included on the album, but would hint at tone and style. The same thing here. Only this trailer, which is pretty badass by the way. features none other than the best Jason Voorhees himself, in my humble opinion. Kane mother hotter as Leatherface. Quick trivia, Kane would end up as a stunt double for R.A. Hmm, Mihailov? One thing, among others, that Burr found frustrating was that part three couldn't be its own thing. Even back then, a single story wasn't the idea, but to set up more sequels. I mean, I, mean, I don't know why. Is the expectation and the idea that the film can't function just as a film, it's gotta function as a kickoff to more films. To get their specific vision, splatterpunk author David Scow, who ironically almost wrote Nightmare on Elm Street 5, with his mock-up Freddy Rules being considered for what would eventually become the dream child. Scow was hired to bring the franchise back to its roots, or as he said himself, just kind of tip the hat but not Xerox the first movie. Leatherface was conceived with the intention of making what every American evangelist claimed 
about the original. A nasty, mean, bloody movie. And to me, what sounds like a good time. Remember this for later, but part three's entire existence was to go mean, messy, and over the top. To go where the franchise has really always belonged. David Scow got to work revisiting the original to find the seeds he needed to grow his own story while keeping it true to what came before. His first order of business was to get rid of the original Sawyer family and implement an adopted nuclear family, a group of misfits who are bound by their murderous tendencies and not by blood. Well, I guess they are bound by blood, but what I mean is they won't be related. The plan was to disregard the sequel and aim for a reboot, yet sequel-ish, that nodded to previous entries, but in more of an easter egg way. I mean, it's a film equivalent of having your cake and eating it too. Hence, Stretch has a cameo, as herself, who is now leveled up as a reporter, despite part two being erased from this timeline. Not one to cast any big stars, they went with genre staples and some great indie newcomers. I mean, look at a young Viggo Mortensen. What I like about Tex is that he plays it in a kind of a sensitive way, and who may be putting on sort of a tough guy facade. I wish you'd call me Tex. I told you. <laughs> I'm sorry, boy. God damn it, I'm sorry. Kate Hodge plays an excellent Scream Queen, with a perfect amount of vulnerability but could still stand tall when the situation arises. The legendary Ken Foray was added because of his genre appeal, and fit the character of Benny, a young Tina from Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, shows up as a little girl who may be Leatherface's daughter, according to Mihailov. The cast was set and shooting was a hustle. Being shot in California, as every other chance that film was rightfully shot in Texas prior, made for some difficulties. Some sets were built prior to Burr being hired, while sets for the last two thirds of the film were not. So Burr had to kind of find a way to shoot around what was already given to him. Most of the film was shot in a place in California called the New Hall Ranch, which is located stupidly close to Magic Mountain. And you could actually hear faint screams of kids on roller coasters in some scenes in the VHS version. Though New Line hired Burr, it was clear right into shooting they didn't like him. Like the micromanaging c**ts they are, New Line's lackeys came down on Burr for the smallest thing. Word in the street has it that he wanted to make this gory, as was the plan all along, but New Line got cold feet and found every excuse to undermine him. That and the constant pressure to keep on schedule as any minute over wouldn't be tolerated. Now, knowing that every movie needs some sort of reshoots, they wouldn't give Burr any wiggle room, not even an inch. Going as far as asking him for his shot list for the upcoming week, or he'd be fired. Now, New Line actually fired Burr because they didn't think he was fast enough. And even though it was clear that he was, he wasn't behind schedule, they just didn't trust him. Thinking that they could quickly get a new director to step into the ongoing production was a foolish mistake. And two days later, they rehired him. The stipulations were basically that time was key, and he had to cut down the gore, which they previously agreed to, to get this production wrapped up to meet the November 3rd premiere. The second in command at New Line hated the film, found it to be trashy and offensive. Surprisingly, the test screening was positive, but they got the unfortunate news that in its current state, Chainsaw 3 would be banned overseas. And so the second sequel was about to get the sweet kiss of death from the MPAA who gave the first cut the dreaded X, which caused quite a controversy. Knowing that the film always had to get an R rating, Burr submitted Chainsaw 3 over 11 times, with a few notable cuts. The Sarah character is bisected by the chainsaw, with even Greg Nicotero holding below the blood pump and the body rig. That was just turned into a chainsaw stab. There's a scene where the little girl kills Ryan with a sledgehammer pulley system, which the MPAA thought was a step too far, having a kid basically murder somebody, and cut it in an awkward way where she just seems to be there. Tex, charred to a crisp, gets impaled by one of the family's own traps. And a lot more like that, a lot of brute force. Blood squibs, just kind of like that, that, that salt and pepper kind of gore you need in a film, was cut to the bone. They even reshot Benny's death, which was uh, pretty permanent where Benny saves a day, and him and Michelle ride off into the southwest sun. New Line even went behind Burr's back and shot a whole different ending. Rumor has it that Burr didn't even know they changed the ending until he saw it himself in theaters. Where Burr's original ending had Michelle see the little girl in the back of the police squad, realizing that it never ends and that more are involved. B 
because of these cuts and alterations, Chainsaw 3 missed its November release dates and ended up being dumped in January, debuting at number 11. Critics and audiences hated it. They felt New Line betrayed them. And even after all the cuts, it was still banned in many overseas countries, including England. As the first non-Toby Hooper sequel, it was seen as sadistic and mean, unneeded. Now, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 in its purest form is what it was always meant to be, a mean, bloodier, and more polished companion piece to the original. It took up until 2018 to finally get an unrated, cleaned up Blu-ray edition. I'm glad to say that Chainsaw 3 was finally course corrected and that the true vision of Jeff Burr can be seen in HD glory. And it's a badass movie. Pretty goddamn good, you backwoods motherfucker. That was always just trying to entertain. I went to awake on the soaked streets of Blue Island. And my father, though a strong man, you know I swear. Another generation gone has seen South Poseidon. When you say a prayer and you put him in the ground, you speak a whiskey and it's Markham bound. Ain't no new shit going down on the soaked streets of Blue Island.